Chapter Twelve of Shorty McCabe by Sewell Ford. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. You'd most think after that I'd cut out of the country for a while, but say, I'm getting so I can stand a whole lot of real breathing air. Anyway, I put the studio on summer schedule, and every Saturday about noon I pikes out to Primrose Park to see if me estates growed any during the week. Well, the last time I does it. I drops off about two stations too soon, thinking a little outdoor leg work would do me good. It was a grand scheme, and I'd been all right if I'd followed the trolley track along the post road. But the gasoline carts was so thick, and I got the breathing so much gravel that I switches off. I takes a nice looking lane that appears like it might bring me out somewhere near the place I was heading for. But as I ain't much on finding my way where they don't have signboards at the corners, the first thing I knows, I've made so many turns I don't know whether I'm going out or coming back. It was while I was doing the stray act and wondering if it was going to shower or was only just bluffing that I bumps into this incubator bunch, and the performance begins. For a squint I took, I thought somebody'd been setting out a new kind of shrubbery and then I sized it up for a lot of umbrella jars that had been dumped there. But pretty soon I sees that it's nothing but a double row of kids all dressed the same. There must have been more than a hundred of them, and they was standing quiet by the side of the road, just as much at home as if that was where they belonged. Now, it ain't the regular thing to find any such aggregation as that on the back lane, and if I'd had as much sense as a family horse in a carry-all, I'd shied and rambled the other way. But I has to get curious and see what it's all about, so I blazes ahead, figuring on taking a good look as I goes by. At the head of the procession was a lady and gent holding some kind of exercises, and as I comes up, I notices something familiar about the lady's back hair. She turns around just then, gives a little squeal, and makes for me with both hands out. Sure, it was her. Sadie Sullivan, that was. Well, I knew that Sadie was liable to be floating around anywhere in Westchester County, for that seems to be her regular stamping ground since she's got the traveling with the country house set. But I wasn't looking to run across her just then in that company. Oh, Shorty, says she, you're a lifesaver. I've half a mind to hug you right here. If it wasn't for giving an exhibition, says I, I'd lend you the other half. But how does the lifesaving come in? And where do you collect so many kids all of a size? Is that Pop there? And I jokes me thumb at the gent. Captain Kenwoody, says Sadie, I want you to know my friend, Professor McCabe. Shorty, this is Captain Sir Hunter Kenwoody of the British War Office. Woody, says I, how goes it? Charmed to meet you, I'm sure, says he. Oh, splash, says I, you don't mean it. Well, say... Here was a star. His get-up was something between that of a mounted cop and the leader of a Hungarian band, and he was as stiff as if he'd been dipped in the glue pot the day before. I'd heard something about him from Pinckney. He'd drawn plans and specifications for a new forage cap for the British Army, and on the strength of that, he'd been sent over to the States to inspect belt buckles or something of the kind. Talk about your cinch jobs. Those are the lads that can pull him out. On his off days, and he had five or six a week, Woody'd been ornamenting the top of tally hoes and resting up at such places as Rocky Wold and Apawamis Arms. Seems like he'd discovered Sadie, too, and had booked himself for her steady company. From her story, it looked like they'd been taking a little drive around the country, when they ran up against this crowd of kids and checked dresses from the incubator home. There was a couple of noises hoiding the bunch, and they'd all been sent up the sound on an excursion barge for one of these fresh air blowouts that always seems like an invitation for trouble. Everything had gone lovely until the chowder barge had got mixed up with a tow of coal scows and got bumped so hard that she sprung a leak. There hadn't been any great danger, but the excitement came along in chunks. The crew had run the barge ashore and landed the whole crowd, but in the mix-up, one of the women had backed off the gangplank into three feet of water, and the other had sprained an ankle. 
the pair of em was all to the bad when sadie and the cap came along and found em trying to lead their flock to the nearest railroad station of course sadie had piled right out loaded the nurses into the carriage telling the driver to find the next place where the cars stopped and come back after the kids with all the buggies he could find while she and woody stood by to see that the incubators didn't stampede and get scattered all over the lot so here we are says sadie with all these children and a shower coming up now what shall we do and where shall we go say says i i may look like an information bureau but i don't feel the part sadie couldn't get it through her head though that i wasn't a johnny on the spot because i bought a place somewhere in the country she thought i could draw a map of the state with my eyes shut we ought to start right away says she she was more or less of a prophet too that thunderstorm was getting busy over long island and there was every chance of it coming our way it lets loose a good hard crack and the englishman begins to look worried oh i say now says he hadn't i better jog off and hurry up that bloomin coachman all right run along says sadie you should have seen the start of that run he got under way like a man on stilts and he was about as limber as a pair of fire tongs but then them leather cuffs on his legs and the way his coat hugged the small of his back wasn't any help i was enjoying his motion so much that i hadn't paid any attention to the kids and i guess sadie hadn't either but the first we knows they all falls in behind two by two hand in hand and goes trottin along behind em stop em stop em says sadie whoa cheese it come back here i yells they didn't give us any more notice though than as if we'd been holdin our breath the head pair had their eyes glued on the captain they were the leaders and the rest followed like they'd been tied together with a rope they was all goyles and i guess they averaged about five years old i thought at first they all had on aprons but now i sees that every last one of em was wearing a life preserver they had tied the things on after the bump and i suppose the noises had been too rattled to take em off since maybe it won the sight to see them bobbin up and down woody he looks round and sees what's comin after em and waves for em to go back not much they stops when he stops but when he starts again they're right after him he unlimbers a little and tries to break away but the kids jump on to the double quick and hang on to him i knew what was up then they'd sized him up for a cop and cops was what they was used to you've seen those lines of home kids being passed across the street by the traffic squad well having lost their noises and not seeing anything familiar looking about sadie or me they made up their minds that woody was it they meant to stick to em until something better showed up once i got this through my nut i makes a sprint to the head of the column and gets a grip on the cap see here woody says i you're elected you'll have to stay by the kids until relieved they've adopted you oh i say now says he this is too beastly absurd you know it's a bore why if i don't find some place or other very soon i'll get a wetting you can't go anywhere without those kids says i so come along back with us we need you in our business he didn't like it a little bit for he figured on shaking the bunch of us but he had to go and when he came right about face the procession did a snake movement there in the road that would have done credit to the seventh regiment i'd been looking around for a place to make for off over the trees toward the sound was a flagpole that i reckon stood on some kind of a building and there was a road running that way we'll mosey down towards that says i but we can make better time cap'n if you could get your party down to lightweight marching order suppose you give the command for them to shed them cork jackets why really now says he looking over the crowd kind of helpless i haven't the faintest idea how to do it you know well it's up to you says i make a speech to em say that was the dopiest bunch of kids i ever saw they acted like they'd won more than half alive standin there in pairs and quiet as sheep waitin for the word but that's the way they're bringin em up in these homes like so many machines and they didn't know how to act any other way 
Sadie saw it and dropped down to her knees to gather as many as she could get her arms around. Oh, you poor little wretches, says she, beginning to sniffle. Cut it out, Sadie, says I. There ain't any time for that. Unbuckle them belts. Turn the cap and get on the job. You're in this. As soon as Woody showed them what was wanted, though, they skinned themselves out of those canvas sinkers in no time at all. We left the truck in the road, and with the English gent for drum major, Sadie in the middle, and me playing snapper on the end, we starts for the flagpole. I thought maybe it might be a hotel, but when we got there, the road opened up out of the woods to show us how near the sound was. I see that it's a yacht club, with a lot of flags flying and a whole bunch of boats anchored off. About then, we felt the first wet spots. They've got to take us into that clubhouse, says Sadie. We got as far as the gates, one of these fancy kind, with the hood top over the posts, like the roof of a summer house when the sprinkler was turned on in earnest. Woody was getting raindrops on his new uniform. He didn't like it. I'll stay here, says he, and bolts under cover. The incubator kid swings like they was on a pivot and piles in after him. There wasn't anything to do but stop under the gate, seeing as the clubhouse was a hundred yards or so off. I snaked Woody out, though, and made him help me range the youngsters under the middle of the roof. And when we got him packed in four deep, with Sadie squeezed in, too, there wasn't an inch of room for either of us left. And was it raining? Wow! You'd thought four eights had been rung in and all the water towers in New York was toying loose on us. And the thunder kept ripping and roaring and the chain lightning streaked up like the finish of one of Colonel Plain's exhibits. Sing to them, shouts Sadie. It's the only way to keep them from being scared to death. Sing. Do you hear that, Woody? says I across the top of their heads. Sing to them, you lobster. The captain was standing just on the other side of the bunch. He got the front half of them under cover, but there wasn't room for the rest. So it didn't do him much good, for the roof eaves was leaking down the back of his neck at the rate of a gallon a minute. Only foo foo fancy, says he. I don't foo feel like singing, you know. Make a noise like you did then, says I. Come on now. But really, I can't, says he. I n never sing, you know? I say, that gave me the backache. See here, Woody, says I, looking as wicked as I knew how. You sing or there'll be trouble. Hit her up now. That fetched him. He opened his face like he'd swallowed something bitter, made one or two false starts, and strikes up, God save the king. I didn't know the words to that, so I makes a stab at everybody works but father and Sadie tackles something else. For a trio, that was the limit. The kids hadn't seemed to mind the thunder and lightning a whole lot, but when that three-cornered symphony of ours cut loose, they begins to look wild. Some of them was digging their fists into their eyes and preparing to leak brine, when all of a sudden, Woody gets into his stride and lets go of three or four notes that sounded as if they might belong together. That seemed to cheer those youngsters up a lot. One or two pipes up, kind of scared and trembly, but hanging on to the tune. And the next thing we knew, they was all at it, giving us my country tis of thee in fine shape as you'd want to hear. We quit then and listened. They followed up with a couple of good old hymns, and if I hadn't been afloat from my shoes up, I might have enjoyed the program. It was a good exhibition of noive, too. Most kids of that size would have gone up in the air and howled blue moida, but they didn't even show white round the gills. Inside of ten minutes it was all over. The shower had moved off into Connecticut where maybe it was wanted worse, and we got our heads together to map out the next act. Sadie had to say. She was for taking the kids over to the swell yacht club there and waiting until the noises of someone else came to take them off our hands. That suited me, but when it came to getting Captain Sir Hunter to march up front and set the pace, he made a strong kick. Oh, by Jove, now, says he, I couldn't think of it. Why, I'd been guest here, you know, and I might meet some of the fellows. 
What luck, says Sadie. That'll be lovely if you do. You come along, Woody, says I. We've got our orders. He might have been a stiff-looking Englishman before, but he was limp enough now. He looked like a linen collar that had been through the wash and hadn't reached the starch tub. His coattails was still dripping water, and when he walked, it sounded like someone was mopping up a marble floor. Only fancy what they'll think, he kept saying to himself as he got under way. They'll take you for an anti-race suicide club, says I, so brace up. We hadn't more than struck the clubhouse porch, and the steward had rushed out to drive us away when Sadie gives another one of them squeals that means she's sighted something good. Oh, there's the Dixie girl, says she. You must have em bad, says I. I don't see any girl. The yacht, says she, pointing to the end of the dock. That big white one. It's Mrs. Brindley Cub's Dixie girl. You wait here until I see if she's aboard. And she goes off. So we lined up in front to wait, the incubators never taking their eyes off and woody, and him as pink as a sportin' extra, and saying things under his breath. Every time he took a hitch sideways, the whole line dressed. All hands from the club turned out to see the show, and the rockin' chair skippers made funny cracks at us. Ahoy, the nursery, says one guy. Where you bound for? Ask Papa, says I. He's got the tickets. Woody kept his face toined and his jaw shut, and if he had any friends in the crowd, I guess they didn't spot him. I'll bet he wasn't sorry when Sadie shows up on deck and waves for us to come on. Mrs. Brindley Cobbs was there, all right. She was a tall, loppy kind of female, ready to gush over anything. As well as I could size up the game, she was one of the near swells with plenty of guilt but not enough sense to use it right. Her feelings were in good working order, though, and she was willing to listen to any program that Sadie had on hand. Bring the little dears right aboard, says she, and we'll have them home before dark. Why, Sir Hunter, is it really you? I'm not altogether sure, says Woody, whether it is or not. And he made a dive to get below. Well, say, that was a yacht and a half, that Dixie girl, and inside of her was slicker than any parlor car you ever saw. While they was getting up steam, and all the way down to the East River, Mrs. Cubs had the hired hands lugging up every eatable they could find, from chicken salad to ice cream, and we all took a hand passing it out to the incubator bunch. They knew what grub was, yes, yes. There wasn't any holding back for an imitation cop to give the signal. The way they did stow in good things that they'd probably never dreamed about was enough to make a man wish he had John D.'s pile and Jake Ree's heart. I forgot all about being wet, and so did Woody. To see him juggling stacks of loaded plates, you'd think he graduated from a ham and factory. He seemed to like it, too, and he was wearing what passes for a grin among the English aristocracy. By the time we got to the dock on East 34th Street, there was more solid comfort and stomach ache in that cabin than it'll hold again in a thousand years. Sadie had me go ashore and telephone for two of them big rubberneck wagons. That gave us time to get the sleepers woke up and arrange them on the dock. Just as we was getting the last of the kids loaded in for their ride up to the home, a roundsman shows up with two cops. Where do you kids belong? he sings out. With that, there comes a howl and a whole bunch of yells. Hot potato, cold tomato, alligator, Rome. We're the girls from the incubator home. Caught with the goods, says he, turning to Captain and me. You're arrested for wholesale kidnapping. There's a general alarm out for yous. Ah, back to the goats, says I. You don't think we look nutty enough to steal a whole orphan asylum, do you, Rounds? I wouldn't trust either of you alone with the brick block, says he. And your side partner with the Salvation Army coat looks like a yegg man to me. Now will you be a nice cap, says I. At this Sadie and Mrs. Cubs tries to butt in, but the roundsman had a head like a chopping block. He said the two noises had come to town and reported that they'd been held up in the woods and that all the kids had been swiped. As Woody fitted one of the descriptions, we had to go to the station. That was all there was about it. And say, if the Sarge hadn't happened to have been one of my old backers, 
we'd have been put in the night with the drunken disorderlies. Of course, when I tells me a little tale, the Sarge give me the ha-ha and scratches our names off the book. We didn't lose any time either in hitting the studio where there was a hot bath and dry towels. But paste this in your Panama. Next time me and Woody goes out to rescue the fatherless, we takes along our raincoats. We've shook hands on that. End of chapter 12、Chapter、Thirteen of Shorty McCabe by Sewell Ford. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. How's Woody and Sadie coming on? Ah, say, you don't want to take the things she does too serious. It's got to be a real live one that interests Sadie. And anyway, Woody's willing to take the oath that she put up a job on him. So it's all off. And I guess I ain't so popular with her as I might be. Anyway, I wouldn't blame her, after the exhibition I made the other night, for classing me with the phonies. It was trouble I hunted up all by myself. Say, if I hadn't been having a dopey streak, I'd have known something was about due. There hadn't a thing happened to me for more'n a week when Pickney blows into the studio one morning, casual like, as if he'd only come in cause he found the door open. That should have put me leery, but it didn't. I gives him the hail and tells him he's looking like a pink just off the ice. Shorty, says he, how are you on charity? Oh, I'm a cinch, says I. Every panhandler north of Madison Square knows he can wake me for a beer check any time he can run me down. Then you'll be glad to exercise your talents in aid of a worthy cause, says he. I don't follow, says I. The deserving poor I passes up. There's too much done for em as it is. It's the unworthy kind that wins my coin. They enjoys it more and has a harder time getting it. Your logic is good, Shorty, says he. And I think I agree with your sentiments. But this is a case where charity is only an excuse. The ladies out at Rocky Wold are getting up an affair for the benefit of something or other, no one seems to know just what, and they've put you down for a little bag punching and club swinging. Then wire him to scratch the entry, says I. I don't make any orchestra circle plays that I can dodge. And when it comes to fighting the leather before a bunch of peacock millinery, I reneges every time. I'll put on Swifty Joe as a sub if you gotta have someone. Pickney shook his head at that. No, says he, I'll tell Sadie she must leave you off the program. Hold on, says I. Was it Sadie billed me for this stunt? He said it was. Then I'm on the job, says I. Oh, you can grin your ears off. I don't care. Well, that was what fetched me out the Rocky Wolves on a Friday night when I had a right to be watching the amateur tryouts at the Maryborough Club instead. The show wasn't until Saturday evening, but Pinkney said I ought to be there for the dress rehearsal. There's only about a dozen guests there now, so you needn't get skittish, says he. And a dozen don't go far towards filling up a place like Rocky Wold. Say, if I had the price, I'd like a shack where I could take care of more or less company without setting up cot beds, but I'll be blistered if I can see the fun in running a free hotel like that. These amateur shows are apt to be pretty punk, but I could see that, barring myself, there was a fair aggregation of talent on hand. The star was a goo goo eyed girl who did a barefoot specialty, reciting poems to music. And accompanying herself with a kind of parlor hoochie coochie that would have drawn capacity houses at Dreamland. Then there was a pretty boy who could do things to the piano, a funeral faced duck that could tell funny stories, and a bunch of six or eight likely looking ladies and gents who laid themselves out to prance through what they called a minuet. Lastly, there was me and Miriam. She was one of these limp shingle chested girls, Miriam was. She didn't have much to say, so I didn't take any particular notice of her. But at the rehearsal, I got next to the fact that she could tease music out of a violin in great style. It was all right if you shut your eyes, for Miriam wasn't what you would call a pastel. She was built a good deal on the lines of an L Road pillar, but that didn't bar her from wearing one of these short sleeved, square necked, goily goily dresses that didn't leave you much in doubt as to her framework. Yes, 
Miriam could have stood a few well-placed pads. She'd lived long enough to have found that out, too, but they was missing. I should guess that Miriam had begun exhibiting her collarbones to society about the time poor old John L. fought the Battle of New Orleans. Yet when she snuggled the butt end of that violin down under her chin and squinted at you across the bridge, she had all the motions of a high school girl. Of course, I didn't dope all this out to myself at the time, for as I was saying, I didn't size her up special. But it all came to me afterwards. Yes, yes. The excitement broke loose long about the middle of that first night. I turned in about an hour before and was pounding my ear like a circus hand at a Sunday layover when I hears the trouble cry. First off, I wasn't going to do any more than turn over and get a fresh hold on the mattress, for I ain't much on routing out for fires unless I feel the headboard getting hot. But then I wakes up enough to remember that Rocky Wold is a long ways outside the Metropolitan Fire District, and I begins to throw clothes onto myself. Inside of two minutes, I was outdoors looking for a chance to win a Carnegie medal. There wasn't any show at all, though. The fire, what there was of it, was in the kitchen, in the basement of the wing where the help stays. Half a dozen stablemen had put it out with the garden hose and were finishing the job by soaking one of the cooks when I showed up. I watched him for a while, and then I started back to my room. Somehow I got twisted up in the shrubbery, and instead of going back the way I came, I gets round on the other corner. Just about then, a ground-floor window is shoved up, and a female in white floats out on the little stone balcony. She waves her arms and begins to call for help. "'You're late,' says I. It's all over. That didn't satisfy her at all, though. Some smoke and steam was still coming up from the far side of the building, and it was blowing in through another window. Help, help, she squeals. Help before I jump. I wouldn't, says I. They've gone home with the life net. The smoke, the smoke, says she. Oh, I must jump. Well, if you've got the jumping fit, says I, jump ahead. But if you can hold yourself a minute, I'll bring a step ladder. Then hurry, please hurry, says she, and starts to climb up on the edge of the balcony. It wasn't more than six feet to the toif anyway, and it wouldn't have been any killing matter if she had jumped, less than she landed on a neck. But she was as loony as if she'd been standing on top of a flat iron building. Being as how I'd forgot to bring a step ladder with me, I chases around after something she could come down on. The moon wasn't shining very bright, though, and there didn't seem to be any boxes or barrels lying round loose, so I wasn't making much headway. But after a while, I gets hold of something that was the very ticket. It was one of these wooden stands for flower pots. I lugs that over and sets it up under the window. Now, if you'll just slide down onto that easy, says I, your life is saved. She looks at it once and begins to flop her arms and take on again. I never can do it. I know I can't, says she. I'll fall. I'll fall. Well, it was a case of Shorty McCabe to the rescue, after all. Coming up, says I, and hops on the thing, holding out me paws. She didn't need any more coaxing. She scrabbled over that balcony rail and got a shoulder clutch on me that you couldn't have loosened with a crowbar. I gathered in the rest of her with my left hand and steadied myself with the other. Lucky she wasn't a heavyweight, or well, that potholder wouldn't have stood the strain. It creaked some as we went down, but it held together. Street floor, all out, says I as I hit the grass. But that didn't even get a wiggle out of her. It's all over, says I. You're rescued. Talk about your cling stones. She was it. Never a move. I couldn't tell whether she fainted or was too scared to let go, but it was up to me to do something. I couldn't stand there for the rest of the night holding a strange lady draped the way she was, and it didn't seem to be just the right thing to sit down to it. Besides, one of her elbows was trying to puncture my right lung. If you're over the fire panic, I'll try and hoist you back through the window, miss, says I. She wasn't ready to do any conversing then, though. She was just holding on to me like I was too good a thing to let slip. 
Well, it looks to me as though we'd got to make a front entrance, says I. But I hope the audience will be slim. And with that, I starts to finish the lap around the house and makes for the double doors. I've carried weight before, but never that kind, and it seemed like that blamed house was as big around as a city block. Once or twice we butted into the bushes, and another time I nearly tumbled the two of us into the pool of a fountain. But after a while I struck the front porch, some out of breath, and with a few wisps of black hair in my eyes, but still in the game. The lady hadn't made a moima, and she hadn't slacked her cinch. I was hoping to slide in quiet without being spotted by anyone, for most of the women had gone back to bed and I could hear the men down in the billiard room clicking glasses over an extra dream soother. Luck was against me, though. Right under the newel post light stood Pinckney, wearing a silk pajama coat outside of a pair of black broadcloth trousers. When he sees me and what I was lugging, he looks kind of pleased. Hello, shorty, says he. What have you there? It might be a porous plaster by the way it sticks, says I but it ain't. It's a lady I've been rescuing while the rest of you guys was standing around watching a wet cook. By Jove, says Pinckney, stepping up and taking a close look. Miriam. Thanks, says I. We ain't been introduced yet. You mind unhooking her fingers from the back of my neck? But all he did was to stand there with his mouth corners working, and them black eyes of his winking like a pair of arc lights. It's too pretty a picture to spoil, says he. So touching. Reminds me of Andromeda and what's-his-name. Just keep that pose a minute, will you, until I bring up the rest of the fellas. You'll bring up nothing, says I, reaching out with one hand and getting a grip on the collar of his silk jacket. Now get busy or off comes your kimono. With that, he quits kidding and goes to work on Miriam's fingers, and in about a minute she gives a little jump, like she just heard the breakfast bell. Why, says she, where am I? Right where you landed five minutes ago, says I. Then she shudders all over and squeals, Oh, a man, a man. Sure, says I, you didn't take me for a Morris chair, did you? Miriam didn't linger for any more. She lets loose a holler that near splits me ear open, slides down so fast that a bare tootsies hit the floor with a spat, grabs her what do you call it up away from her ankles with both hands, and sprints down the hall as if she was making for the last car. Say, says I, getting my neck out of crook, I wish that thought had come to her sooner. I feel as if I'd been squeezed by a pair of ice tongs. If she can lug like that in a sleep, what could she do when she was wide awake? Shorty, says Pinckney, with his face as solemn as a preacher's, I'm pained and astonished at this. Me too, says I. Don't jest, says he. This looks to me like an attempt at kidnapping. If you'd had that grip on you, I guess you'd have thought it was the real thing, says I. But here's a little tip I want to pass on to you. Don't go spreadin' this Josh business around the lot, or your show'll be minus a star act. I'll stand for all the private kidding you can hand out, but I've got my objections to playing a public joke book part. Now, will you quit? He was mighty disappointed at having to do it, but he gave his word, and I makes tracks upstairs, glad enough to be left off so easy. It was a queer kind of a faint, that's what it was, says to myself. I'll bet I fight shy of anything more of the kind that I sees coming my way. This is what I gets for straying so far from Broadway. But a little thing like that don't interfere with my sleepin' when slumber's on the card, and I proceeds to tear off what was due me on the eight-hour schedule, and maybe a little more. I didn't get a sight of Miriam all day long. Not that I was strainin' my eyes any. There was something better to look at. Sadie, for instance. Of course, Pinckney was bossin' the show, but she was bossin' him and anyone else that was handy. They were going to pull off the racket in the ballroom, and Sadie found a lot to do to it. She's a hummer, Sadie is. Maybe she wasn't brought up among bow-legged English butlers and a lot of Swedish maids, but she's learned the trick of getting them to break their necks for her whenever she says the word. All the forenoon, more folks kept coming on every train, and there was two rows of them big, deep-breathing touring cars in the stables. 
By dinner time, Rocky Roll looked like a Saratoga hotel during the racing season. Chappies were playing lawn tennis and lugging golf bags around and keeping the ivories rolling while the front walks and porches might have been Fifth Avenue on a Monday afternoon from the dry goods that was being sported there. I stowed myself away in a corner of the billiard room and didn't mix much, but I was taking it all in. Not that I was feeling lonesome or anything like that. I likes to see any sort of fun, even if it ain't just my kind. And besides, there was more or less in the bunch that I knew first rate. But I don't care about pushing to the front unless I gets the call. So everything runs along smooth, and I was figuring on making a late train down to Primrose Park after I'd done my little toying. I didn't care much about seeing the show, so I stuck to the dressing room until they sends word that it was my next. We'd had a punching bag apparatus rigged up in the forenoon, and there wasn't anything left to be done but hook on the leather and spread out the mat. Pinckney was doing the announcing, and the jolly he gives me before he lugs me out was something fierce. I reckon I was blushing some when I went on. I took just one squint at the mob and felt a chill down my spine. Say, it's one thing to step up before a gang of sports in a hall, and another to prance out in ring clothes on a platform in front of two or three hundred real ladies and gents wearing their evening togs. There I was, though, and the crowd doing the hurrah act for all it was worth. When I gets the bag going, I feels better, and whatever grouch I has against Pinckney for not letting me wear my gym suit, I puts into short arm punches on the pigskin. The stunt seemed to take. I could tell that by the buzz that came over the footlights. No matter what you're doing, whether it's making campaign speeches or stopping a comer in six rounds, it's always a help to know that you've got the crowd with you. By the time I got well warmed up and was throwing in all the flourishes that's been invented, double ducks, side step and swing, shoulder wake and so on, I felt real chipper. I makes a grandstand finish and then has the nerve to face the audience and do a matinee bend. As I did that, I gets my lamps fixed on someone in the front row. Say, if you've ever done much on the platform, you know how sometimes you'll get a squint at a pair of eyes down front and you can't get yourself away from them after that. Well, that was the way with me then. There was rows and rows of faces that all looked alike, but this one fizz seemed to stand right out and to save me, all I could do was stare back. It belonged to Miriam. She had her chin tucked down and her head canted to one side and her mouth puckered into a mushiest kind of a grin you ever saw. Her eyes were rolled up real kittenish, too. Oh, it was a combination to make a man strike his grandmother, that look she was sending up to me. I wanted to dodge it and pick up another but there was no more getting away from it than as if I was being followed by a search light. Worst of it was, I could feel myself grinning back at her just as mushy. I was getting sillier every breath, and I might have got as far as blowing kisses at her if I hadn't pulled myself together and begun to juggle the Indian clubs for the second half of my act. All the ginger had faded out of me, though, and I cut the rest of it mighty short. As I comes off, Sadie grabs me and begins to tell me what a hit I'd made and how tickled she was, but I shakes her off. "'What's your great rush, Shorty?' says she. "'I got a date to fill down the road,' says I, and I makes a quick break for the dressing room. Honest, I was getting rattled for fear if Miriam should get another look at me, she'd mesmerize me so I'd never wake up. I skins into my sack suit, leaves Wade to have my bag expressed to town, and was just about to make a sudden exit when I bumps into someone at the front door. Oh, Mr. McCabe, how did you know where to find me, says she. Say, I'll give you one guess. Sure, it was Miriam again. She was got up all expensive, all real lace and foist water sparks, and just as handsome as a towel rack. But the minute she toins on that gushy look, I'm nailed to the spot, same as the rabbits they feed to the boa constrictors up at the zoo. You didn't think you could lose me so easy, did you? says I. What a persistent fellow you are, says she. But after you behaved so heroically last night, I suppose I must forgive you. Wasn't it silly of me to be so frightened? Oh, well, says I. 
the best of us is apt to go off our nuts sometimes. How sweet of you to put it that way, says she, and then she uncorks a giggle. You did carry me so nicely, too. That was a sample. I wouldn't go on and give you the whole book of the opera for money. It's something I'm trying to forget. But we swapped that kind of slush for near half an hour, and when the show broke up and the crowd began to swarm towards the buffet lunch, we was sitting out on the porch in the moonlight, still at it. Pinkney says we was holding hands and gazing at each other like a couple of spoons in the park. Maybe we was. I wouldn't swear different. All I know is that after a while I looks up and sees Sadie standing there piping us off, with her nose in the air and the heat lightning kind of glimmering in them blue eyes of hers. The spell was broke quicker than when the curtain goes down and the ushers open the lobby doors. Of course, Sadie's nothing more than an old friend of mine, and I'm no more to her. But you see, it hadn't been so long ago that I'd been telling her what a sweat I was in to get away. She never said a word, only just sticks her chin up and laughs, and then goes on. Next minute, there shows up in front of us a fat old lady with three chins and a waist like a clothes hamper. Miriam, says she, and there was wire nails and broken glass in the way she said it. Miriam, I think it was high time you retired. Bully for you, old girl, I sings out, and say, I'll give you a dollar if you lock her in until I can get away. Perhaps that was a low-down thing to say, but I couldn't help letting it come. I didn't wait for any more remarks from either of them, but I grabs my hat and makes a dash across the lots. I never stopped running till I fetched the station, and it wasn't until after the train pulled out that I breathed real easy. Being safe here in the studio with Swifty on guard, I might grin at the whole thing if it wasn't for that laugh of Sadie's. That cut in deep. Two or three days later, I hears from Pinckney. Shorty, says he, you're a wonder. I fancy you don't know what you did in getting so chummy with Miriam under the very nose of that old watchdog Ann of hers. Why, I know of fellas who've waited for years for that chance. Back up, says I. She's a freak. But Miriam's worth three or four millions, says he. I don't care if she owns a bond factory, says I. I'm no bone connoisseur, nor I don't make a specialty of collecting autumn leaves. Do you know what I'd do if I was her aunt? What, says he. Well, says I, I'd hang a red lantern on her. End of chapter 13「Chapter Fourteen of Shorty McCabe by Sewell Ford. This LibriVox recordings in the public domain. You never can tell though the next thing I hears from Sadie is that she's so tickled over that Miriam mix-up that she wakes up in the night to snicker at it. That makes me feel a lot easier in my mind, and just by way of being reckless, I starts out to buy a bull pup. I'd a got him too if it hadn't been for Doc Pinfoodle. Seeing the way things turned out, though, I don't bear no grudge. It was the dark I met first. I'd noticed him drifting up and down the stairs once or twice, but didn't pipe him off special. There's too many freaks around 42nd Street to keep cases on all of them. But one day about a month ago, I was sitting in the front office here, getting the earache from hearing Swifty Joe tell about what he meant to do to Gans that last time, when the door swings open so hard it most takes the hinges off, and we sees a streak of arms and legs and tall hat making a dive under the bed couch in the corner. They've most got the range, Swifty, says I. Two feet to the left and you've been a bull's eye. What you got your mouth open so wide for? Going to try to catch the next one in your teeth? Swifty didn't have time to uncork any repartee before someone struck the land and outside like they'd come down a flight of folding steps feet foist, and a little sharp-nosed woman with purple flowers in a hat bobs in and squints once at each of us. Say, I don't want to be looked at often like that. It felt like being sampled with a cheese tester. Did Montgomery Smith just come in here, says she. Did he? Don't lie now. Where is he? And the way she joiked them little black eyes around was enough to tear holes in the matting. Lady, says I, 
Don't lady me, Mr. Fresh, says she, throwing the gimlets my way. And tell that broken-nosed child stealer over there to take that monkey grin off of his face or I'll scratch his eyes out. Holy gee, yells Swifty, throwing a back somersault through the gym door and snapping the lock on his side. Anything more, miss, says I. We're here to please. Humph, says she. It'd take something better than you to please me. Glad I was born lucky, thinks I, but I thought it under my breath. Is my Monty hiding in that room, says she, jabbing a finger at the gym. Cross my heart, he ain't, says I. I don't believe you could think quick enough to lie, says she, and with that she slips out about as fast as she came in. I didn't stir until I hears her hit the lower hall. Then I bolts the door, goes and calls Swifty down off the top swinging rope, and we comes to a parade rest alongside the couch. Monty, dear Monty, says I, the cyclone's passed out to sea. Come out and give up your rain check. He backs out feet foist, climbs up on the couch, and drops his chin into his hands for a minute while he gets over the worst of the shock. Say, at first sight, he won the man you'd think any woman would lose a breath trying to catch, lessen she was his landlady, and that's what I figures out that this female peace disturber was. Monty might have been a winner once, but it was a long spell back. Just then, he was some out of repair. He had a head big enough for a college professor and a crop of hair like an herb doctor. But his eyes were puffy underneath, and you could see by the café au lait tint to his face that his liver had been on a long strike. He was fairly thick through the middle, but his legs didn't match the rest of him. They were too thin and too short. If I'd known you was coming, I'd had the scrub lady dust under there, says I. But it won't need it now for a couple of weeks. He made a stab at saying something, but his breath hadn't come back yet. He revives enough, though, to take a look at his clothes. Then he wakes his silk dicer up off of his ears and has a peek at that. It was a punky lid, all right, but it had saved a lot of wear on his cocoa when he made that slide for home plate and struck the wall. Was this a long-distance run or just a hundred-yard sprint, says I. Never mind if it comes hard. I don't blame you a bit for sidestepping a heart-to-heart -heart talk with any such a rough-and-ready converser as your friend. I'd do the same myself. He looks up kind of grateful at that, and sticks out a soft, ladylike paw for me to shake. Say, that wasn't such a slow play, either. He was too groggy to say a word, but he comes pretty near winning me right there. I set Swifty to wake on him with the whisk broom, hands out a glass of ice water, and in a minute or so his voice comes back. Oh, yes, he had one. It was a little shaky, but barring that, it was as smooth as mayonnaise. And language! Why, just telling me how much obliged he was, he near stood the dictionary on its head. There wasn't no doubt of his warm feeling for me by the time he was through. It was almost like being adopted by a rich uncle. Oh, that's all right, says I. You can use that couch any time the disappearing fit comes on. She was hot on the trail, eh, Monty? It was all a painful, absurd error, says he. A mistaken identity, I presume. Permit me to make myself known to you. And he shoves out his card. Rasmuli Pinfoodle, J.R.D. That was the way it read. Long ways from Smith, ain't it? says I. The foist of it sounds like a Persian rug. My Hindu birth name, says he. I'd a bet you won the domestic filler, says I. The pinhoodle is English, ain't it? He smiles like I'd asked him to split a pint with me and says that it was. But the tag on the end, J.R.D., I passes up, says I. Don't stand for judge of rent dodgers, does it? Those letters, says he, making another merry face, represent the symbols of my Vedic progression. If I'd stopped to think once more, I'd fetched that, says I. It was a jolly. I never had the Vedic progression. Anyways, not enough to know it at the time. But I wasn't going to let him stun me that way. Later on, 
I got next to the fact that he was some kind of a healer, and that the proper thing to do was to call him Doc. Seems he had a four-by-nine office on the top floor back over the studio, and that he was just starting to introduce the Vedic stunt to New York. Mostly he worked the mail-order racket. He showed me his ad in the Sunday personal column, and it was all to the velvet. According to his own specifications, he was a headliner in the East Indian philosophy business, whatever that was. He'd just torn himself away from the crowded heads of Europe for an American tour, and he stood ready to ladle out advice to statesmen, tinker up broken hearts, forecast the future, and map out the road to Wellville for millionaires who'd gone off their feed. He sure had a full bag of tricks to draw from, but I noticed that the more glass balls you try to keep in the air at once, the surer you are to queer the act and Pinfoodle didn't look like a gent that kept the receiving teller working overtime. There was something about him, though, that was kind of dignified. He was the style of chap that would blow his last dime on having his collar and cuffs polished, and would go without eating rather than frisk the free lunch at a beer joint. He was willing to talk about anything but the female with the gimlet eyes and the keen cut of tongue. She is a mistaken, misguided person, says he. And by the way, Professor McCabe, there is a fire escape, I believe, which leads from my office down to your back windows. Would it be presuming too much if I should ask you to admit me there occasionally, in the event of my being, er, pursued again? It ain't a board bill, is it, Doc? says I. Nothing of the kind, I assure you, says he. Glad to hear it, says I. As a rule, I don't run no rock of age's refuge, but I likes to be neighborly, so help yourself. We fixed it up that way, and about every so often I'd see Doc Pinfoodle sliding in the back window with a worried look on his face and iron rust in his trousers. He was a quiet neighbor, though. Didn't torture the cornet or deal in voice culture or get me the cash checks that came back with remarks and red ink written on them. I was wondering how the Vedic stunt was catching on, when all of a sudden he buds out in an eight-dollar hat, this year's model, and begins to lug around an ivory-handled cane. I'm glad they're coming your way, Doc, says I. Thanks, says he. If I can in any measure repay some of the many kindnesses which you have, sponge it off, says I. Maybe I'll want to throw a lady off the scent myself some day. A week or so later I misses him altogether and the janitor tells me he's paid up and moved. Well, they come and go like that, so it don't do to feel lonesome. But I had the floor swept under the couch regular on a chance that he might show up again. It was along about then that I hears about the bull pup. I've been wanting to have one out the Primrose Park, where I goes to prop up the weekend, you know. Pinkney was telling me of a friend of his that owns a likely-looking litter about two months old, so one Saturday afternoon, I starts to hoof it over and size him up. Now that was regular, wasn't it? You wouldn't think a two-eyed man like me could go astray just trying to pick out a bull pup, would you? But look at what I runs into. I'd gone about four miles from home and was hitting up a daddy western clip on the side path when I sees one of them big bay-winded bubbles sliding past like a train of cars. There was a goyle on the back seat that looks kind of natural. She sees me, too, shouts to Francois to put on the emergency brake, and begins waving her parasol at me to hurry on. It was Sadie Sullivan. Hurry up, shorty. Run, she yells. There isn't a minute to lose. I gets up on my toes at that. I hadn't no more than climbed aboard before the machine was tearing up the macadam again. Anybody dying, says I? Or does the bargain counter close at five o'clock? Aunt Tilly's eloping, says she. And if we don't head her off, she'll marry an old villain who ought to be in jail. Not Mr. Pinkney's Aunt Tilly, the old goyle that owns the big place up near Blenmont, says I. That's the one, says Sadie. Why, she's qualified for an old lady's home, says I. You don't mean to say she's got kittenish at her age. There's no age limit to that kind of foolishness, says Sadie, and this looks like a serious attack. 
I've got to stop it, though, for I promised Pinckney that I'd stand guard until he came back from Newport. I hadn't seen the old girl myself, but I knew her record, and now I got it revised to date. She'd hooked two husbands in her time, but neither of em had lasted long. Then she gave it up for a spell, and it wasn't until she was sixty-five that she begins to wear rainbow clothes again and keep her around like one of the squab octet. Lately she begun to show signs of wanting to sit in a shady corner with a man. Pickney had discouraged a bald-headed minister, warned off an old bachelor, and dropped strong hints to a couple of widowers that took to call and frequent for afternoon tea. Then a new one had showed up. He's a sticker, too, says Sadie. I don't know where Aunt Tilly found him, but Pinckney says he's been coming out from the city every other day for a couple of weeks. She's been meeting him at the station and taking him for drives. She says he's some sort of East Indian priest, and that he's given her lessons and a new faith cure that she's taken up. Today, though, after she'd gone off, the housekeeper found that a trunk had been smuggled to the station. Then a note was picked up in a room. It said something about meeting her at the church of St. Paul's in the wood at 4.30, and was signed, Your Darling Mully. Oh, dear, it's almost half past now. Can you go any faster, Francois? I thought he couldn't, but he did. He jammed the speed lever up another notch, and in a minute more we were hitting only the high places. We caromed against them red leather cushions like a couple of pebbles in a bottle, and it was a case of holding on and hoping the thing would stay right side up. I hadn't waked up much enthusiasm about getting to St. Paul's in the wood before, but I did then all right. Never was so glad to see a church loom up as I was that one. That's her carriage at the chapel door, says Sadie. Shorty, we must stop this thing. It's out of my line, says I but I'll help all I can. We made a break for the front door and butted right in, just as though they'd sent us cards. It wasn't very light inside, but down at the far end we could see a little bunch of folks standing around as if they was waiting for something to happen. Sadie didn't make any false motions. She sailed down the center aisle and took Aunt Tilly by the arm. She was a dumpy, pie-faced old girl, with plenty of ballast to keep her shoes down, and a lot of genuine store hair that was puffed and waved like the specimens you see in the Sixth Avenue showcases. She was acting kind of nervous and grinning a silly kind of grin, but when she spots Sadie, she quit that and puts on a look like the hired girl wears when she's been caught being kissed by the grocery boy. "'You haven't done it, have you?' says Sadie. "'No,' says Aunt Tilly but it's going to be done just as soon as the rector gets on his other coat. Now please don't, Mrs. Winfield, says Sadie, getting a waist grip on the old girl and rubbing her cheek up against her shoulder in that purry, coaxing way she has. You don't know how badly we should all feel if it didn't turn out well, and Pinckney, he's a meddlesome, impointant young scamp, says Aunt Tilly, growing red under the layers of rice powder. Haven't I got a right to marry without consulting him, I'd like to know? Oh, yes, of course, says Sadie, soothing her down. But Pickney says, Don't tell me anything that he says, not a word, she shouts. I won't listen to it. He had the impudence to suggest that my dear Mully was a, a corn doctor or something like that. Did he, says Sadie. I wouldn't have thought it of Pickney. Well, just to show him that he was wrong... I would put this affair off until you can have a regular church wedding, with invitations and ushers and pretty flower girls. And you ought to have a gray silk wedding gown. You look perfectly stunning in gray silk, you know. Wouldn't all that be much nicer than running off like this, as though you were ashamed of something? Say, it was a slick game of talk that Sadie handed out then, for she was playing for time. But Aunt Tilly was no come on. Molly doesn't want to wait another day, says she, and neither do I, so that settles it. And here comes the rector now. Looks like we played out our hand, don't it? I whispered to Sadie. Wait, says she. I want to get a good look at the man. He was trailing along after the minister, and it wasn't until he was within six feet of me that I saw who it was. 
Hello, Doc, says I. So you're the dear Mully, are you? He near jumped through his collar, Pinfoodle did, when he gets his lamps on me. It only lasted a minute, though, for he was a quick recoverer. Why, Professor, says he, this is an unexpected pleasure. I guess some of that's right, says I. And say, but he was dressed for the joyful bridegroom part. Striped trousers, frock coat, white puff tie, and white gloves. He'd had a close shave and a shampoo, and the massage artist had rubbed out some of the swelling from under his eyes. Didn't look much like the has been that done the dive under the couch at the studio. Well, well, says I, this is where the private cinch comes in, eh? Doc, you've got a head like a horse. I should think he'd be ashamed of himself, says Sadie, running off with the silly old woman who might be his mother. The Sullivan temper had got the best of her. After that, the deep lard was all over the cook stove. Aunt Tilly throws four cat fits to the minute and lets loose on Sadie with all kinds of polite jabs that she can lay a tongue to. Then Doc steps up, puts a manly arm halfway around her belt line, and lets her weep on the silk facing of his Sunday coat. By this time, the preacher was all broke up. He was a nice, healthy-looking young chap, one of the strawberry blonde kind, with pink and white cheeks, and hair as soft as a toy spaniel's. It turns out that he was new to the job, and this was his first call to spiel off the splicing service. I trust, says he, that there is nothing, er, that no one has any valid objection to the uniting of this couple. I will convince you of that, says Doc Pinfoodle, speaking up brisk and cocky, by putting to this young lady a few pointnick questions. Well, he did. As a cross-examiner for the defense, he was a regular Joe Choate. Inside of two minutes, he'd made torn mosquito netting of Sadie's kick, showing her up for a rank outsider, and put us both through the ropes. Now, says he, with a kind of calm, satisfied, I've swallowed the canary smile, we will proceed with the ceremony. Sadie was near crying with the mad in her, she being a hard loser at any game. You're an old fraud, that's what you are, she spits out, and you're just marrying Pinkney's silly old aunt to get her money. But that rolls off dark like a damage suit off him a corporation. He just smiles back at her and goes to choking up Aunt Tilly. Doc was it and knew where he stood. He had us down and out. In five minutes more, he'd have a two-hundred-pound wife and fifty-thousand-dollar income. It strikes me, says he, over his shoulder, that if I'd got hold of a fortune in the way you got yours, young woman, I wouldn't make any comments about moissonary marriages. Well, say, up to that time I had a half-baked idea that maybe I wasn't called on to block this little game. But when he begins to rub it into Sadie, I sours on Doc right away. And it always does to take one or two good punches to warm me up to a scrap. I begins to do some swift thinking. Hold on there, Doc, says I. I'll give in that you've got our case squashed as it stood. But maybe there's someone else that's got an interest in these doings. Ah, says he, and who might that be? Mrs. Montgomery Smith, says I. It was a chance shot, but it rung the bell. Doc goes as limp as a straw hat that's been hooked up after a dip in the bay, and his eyes took on that shifty look they had the first time I ever saw him. Why, says he, swallowing hard and doing his best to get back the stiff front he'd been putting up. Why, there's no such poison. No, says I. How about the one that calls you Monty and runs you under the couch? It's a lie, says he. She's nothing to me, nothing at all. Oh, well, says I. That's between you and her. She says different. Anyway, she's come clear up here to put in her bid, so it's no more than fair to give her a show. I'll just bring her in. As I starts toward the front door, Doc gives me one look to see if I mean business. Then, Sadie says, he turns the color of pie crust, drops Aunt Tilly as if she were a live wire, and jumps through the back door like he'd been kicked by a mule. 
I got back just in time to see him hurdle a five-foot hedge without stirring a leaf, and the last glimpse we got of him, he was heading for a stretch of woods up Connecticut way. Looks like you just missed assisting at a case of bigamy, says I to the young preacher, as we go bringing Aunt Tilly out of her faint. Shocking, says he, shocking, as he fans himself with a hymn book. He was taking it hard. Aunt Tilly wouldn't speak to any of us, and as we bundled her into her carriage and sent her home, she looked as mad as a settin' hen with a feet tied. Shorty, says Sadie on the way back, that was an elegant bluff you put up. Lucky my hand wasn't called, says I, but it was rough on the preacher chap, wasn't it? He had his mouth all made up to marry someone. Blamed if I didn't want to offer him a job myself. And who would you have picked out, Shorty? says she. Well, says I, looking her over wishful, there ain't never been but one goyle that I'd choose for a side partner, and she's out of my class now. Was her name Sullivan once, says she. It was, says I. She didn't say anything more for a spell after that and I didn't. But there's times when conversation don't fit in. All I know is that you can sit just as close on the back of one of them big benzine carts as you can on a parlor sofa. And with Sadie snuggled up against me, I felt like it was always going to be summer, with Seuss's band playing somewhere behind the rubber trees. First thing I knows, we fetches up at my shack in Primrose Park, and I was standing on the horse block alongside the bubble. Sadie dropped both hands on my shoulders and was turning them eyes of hers on me at close range. Francois was looking straight ahead, and there wasn't anyone in sight. So I just took a good look into that pair of Irish blues. What a chump you are, Shorty, she whispers. Ah, quit your kidding, says I but I didn't make any move, and she didn't. Well, good-bye, says she, letting out a long breath. Bye-bye, Sadie, says I, and off she goes. Say, I don't know how it was, but I've been feeling ever since that I'd missed something that was coming to me. Maybe it was that bull pup I forgot to buy. End of chapter 14《ハッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピーナッピYou see, after I woke up from that last trance, I gets to thinking about Sadie and Miriam and all them false alarms I've been ringing in, and says I to myself, Shorty, if I couldn't make a better showin' than that, I'd quit the game. So I quits. I chases myself back to town for good, says hello to all the boys, and tells Swifty Joe if he sees me making another move towards the country. To heave a sandbag at me. Not that there was any loud call for me to tend out so strict on the physical culture game. I've been kind of easing up on that lately and dipping into outside things. And it was them I needed to keep closer track of. You know, I've got a couple of flat houses up on the west side, and if you let them agents run things their own way, you'll be making almost enough to buy new hall carpets once a year. Then there was ripe chances I was afraid of missing. You see, knocking around so much with the fat wads, I often see spots where a few dollars could be planted right. Sometimes it's a hunch on the market, and then again it's a straight steer on a slice of foot front that's going cheap. I do a lot of dickering that way. Well, I just push through a deal that leaves me considerable on velvet, and I was feeling kind of flush and sassy. When Mr. Ogden calls me up, I wants to know if I can make use of a gilt-edged bargain. Oh, I don't know, says I. What's it look like? It's the Toreador, says he. Sounds good, says I. How much? Cost me forty thousand two years ago, says he. 
but I'm turning it over for twenty-five to the first bidder. We'll say, when old man Ogden slings cold figures at you like that, you can gamble that he's talking straight. I'm it, then, says I. Fifteen down, ten on mortgage. That suits me, says he. I'll have the papers made out today. And say, says I, what is this Toreador, anyway? A racehorse or an elevator apartment? Would you guess it? He'd hung up the receiver. That's what I got for being sporty. But I wasn't going to renege at that stage. I fills out me little blue check and sends her in. And that night I goes to bed without knowing what it is that I've passed up my coin for. It must have been near noon the next day, for I'd written a letter and got my checkbook stubs added up so they'd come within two or three hundred of what the bank folks made it, when a footman in white panties and a plum-colored coat drifts through the studio door. "'Is this Professor McCabe, sir?' says he. "'Yep,' says I. "'There's a lady below, sir,' says he. "'Can she come up?' "'It ain't regular,' says I. "'But I suppose there's no dodging her. "'Tell her to come ahead.' Say, I wasn't fixed up for receiving carriage company. When I writes in figures, I gets more mussed up than as if I'd been in a free-for-all. I'd shed my coat on one chair, my vest on another, slipped off my suspenders, rumbled my hair, and got ink on me in seventeen places. But I didn't have sense enough to say I was out. In a minute or so, there was a click-click on the stairs. I gets a whiff of Lisoire Danube, and in comes a veiled lady. She was a brandied peach, from the outside lines, anyway. Them clothes of hers couldn't have left Paris more than a month before, and they clung to her like a wet undershirt to a fat man. And if you had any doubts as to whether or no she had the goods, all you had to do was to squint at the big amethyst in the handle of the gold net she wore around her neck. For a Felix-Tiffany combination, she was it. You've seen women of that kind, regular walk and expense accounts. So you are Shorty McCabe, are you? says she, giving me a customs inspector look over and kind of sniffing. Sorry I don't suit, says I. How odd, says she. I must make a note of that. Help yourself, says I. Is there anything else? Is it true, says she, that you have bought the Toreador? Who's been giving you that, says I pricking up my ears. Mr. Ogden, says she. He's an authority, says I, and what he says along that line I don't dispute. Then you have bought it, says she. How exasperating. I was going to get Mr. Ogden to let me have the Toreador this week. The whole of it, says I. Why, of course, says she. Gee, thinks I. It can't be an apartment house, then. Maybe it's an oil painting or a parlor car. But there, she goes on, I suppose you only bought it as a speculation. Now, what is your price for next week? Say, for the love of Pete, I couldn't tell what it was gave me a grouch. Maybe it was only the offhand way she threw it out, or the snippy chin toss that goes with it. But I felt like I'd been stroked with a piece of sandpaper. It's too bad, says I, but you've made a wrong guess. I'm using the Toreador next week myself. You, says she, and through the gauze curtain I could see her hump her eyebrows. That finished the job. Even if the Toreador turned out to be a new opera house or a touring balloon, I was going to keep it busy for the next seven days. Why not me, I says. All alone, says she. Well, I didn't know where it would land me, but I wasn't going to have her tag me for a solitaire spender. Not much, says I. I was just making up my list. How do you spell Mrs. Twombly Crane's last name? With a K? Really, says she, do you mean to say that she is to be one of your guests? Then you must be going just where I'd planned to go, to the Newport Evolutions. Sure thing, says I. I'd heard of their having all kinds of fool doings at Newport, but Evolutions wasn't one of them. The bluff had to be made good, though. The lady pushes up her mosquito net and drop like she wanted to see if I was unwinded the string ball or not, and then for a minute she taps her chin with them folding eyeglasses. I wanted to sing out to her that she'd dent the enamel if she didn't quit being so careless, but I held in. 
Say, what's the use in eating carrots and taking buttermilk baths when you can have a mercurized complexion like that laid on at the shop? All of a sudden, she flashes up a little silver case and pushes out a visiting card. There's my name and address, says she. If you should change your mind about using the Toreador, you may telephone me, and I hope you will. Oh, says I, spelling out the old English letters. I've heard of Pinckney speak of you. Well, say, seeing as you're so anxious, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll just put you down for an invite. How does that hit you? I had an idea she might blow up at that. But say, there was nothing of the kind. Why, says she, I'm not sure, but that would be quite a novelty. Yes, you may count on me. Good day. And she was gone, without so much as a thank you kindly. When I came to, I had sized the thing all up. It looked like I got in over my head. I was due to stand for some kind of a racket, but whether it was a picnic or a surprise party, I didn't know. What I wanted just then was information, and for certain kinds of knowledge, there's nobody like Pinckney. I was dead lucky to locate him, too, but I took a chance on his being in town, so I found him at his special corner table in the palm room, just looking a dry martini in the face. Hello, Shorty, says he. Haven't lunched yet, have you? Join me. I will, says I, if you'll answer me two questions. First off, what is it that Mr. Ogden owns that he calls the Toreador? Why, says Pinckney, that's his steam yacht. Steam yacht, says I, getting a good grip on the chair to keep from falling out. And me dead sure it was a bunch of six room and baths. Oh, well, let that pass. What's done is done. Now what's this evolution stunt they're pulling off up at Newport next week? The naval evolutions, of course, says Pinckney. You should read the newspapers, Shorty. I do, says I, but I didn't see a word about it on the sporting page. He gave me the program, though, how they was going to have a sham torpedo battle winded up with the grand illumination of the fleet. You ought to run up and see it, says he. It looks like I had to, says I. But what about the Toreador, says he. Nothing much, says I. Only I've bought the blamed thing. It was Pinckney's turn to grow bug-eyed, but when I'd told him all about the deal and how the veiled lady had stung me into saying what I had, he's as pleased as if he'd been reading the joke column. Shorty, says he, you're a genius. Why, that's the very thing to do. Get together your party, steam up there, anchor in the harbor, and see the show. It's deuced good form, you know. That's all I want, says I. Just so long as I'm sure I'm in good form, I'm happy. But say, I wouldn't dare tackle it unless you went along. I found out later that Pinckney'd turned down no less than three parties of that kind. But when I puts it up to him, he never fiddles short at all. Why, I'd be delighted, says he. With that, we finishes our cold fried egg salad, or whatever fancy dish it was we had on the platter, and then we pikes off to the pier where he says the yacht's tied up. And say, she was something of a boat. She made that Dixie Goyle that Woody and me brought the incubator kids down in look like a canoe. She was white all over, except for a gold streak around her and a couple of dinky yellow masts. I didn't go downstairs. We plants ourselves in some green cushion easy chairs under the back stoop on and and I sends one of the white wing hired hands after the conductor. It's the sailing master you want, says Pinckney. Well, bring him along, too, says I. But there was only the one. He was a solid-built, quiet-spoken chap, with a full set of red whiskers and a state of Maine accent. He said his name was Bassett, and that he was just packing his things to go ashore, having heard that the boat had been sold. The shore'll be there next month, says I. What do you take to stay on the job? Well, he didn't want no iron wakes wages, being content with the captain's salary, so I tells him to take hold right where he left off and tell the rest of the gang they could do the same. So inside half an hour, I has a couple of dozen men on the payroll. Gee, says I to Pinckney, I'm glad the yachting season's most over when I begin. If it wasn't, I'm thinking I'd have to go out nights with a jimmy. 
but Pinckney's busy with his silver pencil, writing down names. There, says he, I've thought of a dozen nice people that I'm sure of, and perhaps I'll remember a few more in the meantime. Say, says I, have you got the Twombly Cranes and Sadie on that list? Oh, certainly, says he, especially Sadie. And then he grins. Well, for about four days I'm the busiest man out of a job in New York. I carries a bunch of railroad stocks on margin, trades off some Bronx building lots for a cold-water tenement, and unloads a street-opening contract that I bought off from a Tammany Hall man. Every time I thinks of that steam yacht, with all of them hands boinin' up my money, I goes out and does some more hustlin'. Say, there's nothing like needin' the dough for keepin' the feller up on his toes, is there? And when the time came to knock off, and I'd reckoned up how much I was to the good, I feels like Johnny Gates after he's cashed his chips. Yes, indeed. I was a gay boy as I goes aboard the Toreador and waits for the crowd to come along. I'd made myself a present of a white flannel suit and a willy collie a yachtin' cap, and if there'd been an orchestra down front, I could have done a yo-ho-ho -ho baritone solo right off the reel. Pickney shows up in good season, and he'd fetched his people all right. There was a string of touring cars and carriages half a block long. They was all friends of mine, too, from Sadie to the little old bishop. And they was nice, decent folks. Maybe they didn't have their pictures printed in the Sunday editions as often as some, but their ice cutters just the same. They all said it was lovely of me to remember them. Ah, put it away, says I. You folks has been blowing me off and on for a year, and this is my first setup. I ain't wise to the way things ought to be done on one of these boudoir boats, but I wants everyone to be happy. Don't wait for the who wants the waiter call, but just act like you was all star boarders. Everything in sight is yours, from the wicker chairs on deck to what's in the ice box below. And I want to say right here that I'm mighty glad you've come. Now, Mr. Bassett. I guess you can tie her loose. Honest, that was the first speech I ever shot off in or out of the ring, but it seemed to go. They was all patting me on the back and giving me the grand jolly when a cab comes down the pier on the jump. Someone waves a red parasol and floats out the veiled lady with a maid. I'd sent her an invite just as I said I would, but I never thought she'd have the front to take it up. We came near missing you, says I, stepping up to the gang plank. But say, she was so busy shaking hands and calling the rest of them by their front names that she didn't see me at all. It was that way all day long while we was going up the sound. She cornered almost everyone else and chinned to em real earnest about something or other, but I never seemed to get in range. Well, I was having too good a time to feel cut up about it, but I couldn't help being curious. One until dinner time that I got a line on her. Say, she was a convoyser. No matter what was opened up, she hoid her cue. And knock! Why, she had a tack hammer in each hand. They was cute, spiteful little taps that made you snicker foist, and then you got ashamed of yourself for doing it. Ain't she got any friends besides what's here, says I to Sadie, after we'd got through and gone up front by ourselves to see the moon rise. I'm not so sure about even these, says Sadie. Then why didn't someone cut in with a comeback, says I. It isn't exactly safe, says she. Oh, says I, she's that kind, is she? You'd think from a talk that she knew only two sorts of women, them that had been divorced and them that ought to be. I'm afraid that's her specialty, said Sadie. Sort of a lady muckraker, eh, says I. Well, I hope all she says ain't so. How about it? Well, that was the beginning of a heart-to-heart -heart talk that lasted for a good many miles. Somehow Sadie and I had never had a real quiet chance like that before, and it came out that we had a lot to say to each other. I don't know how it was, but the rest of them seemed to let us alone. Some was back under the awning and others was downstairs playing whist. There was singing, too, but we couldn't make out just who was doing it and didn't care a whole lot. Anyway, it was the bulliest ride I ever had. The moon come up over Long Island as big as a billboard and as yellow as a chorus girl's hair. 
the air was a kind of soft and warm like you gets in the front room of a turkish bath place and there wasn't anything on either side near in the shore lights way off in the dark it wasn't any time for thinking hard of anyone so we agrees that the lady muckraker must have been born with a bad taste in her mouth and can't help it letting her slide at that i forgot what it was we did talk about it was each other mostly i guess you can do that when you've known anyone as long as we had, and it's a comfort once in a while. After a bit, though, we didn't say much of anything. I was just looking at Sadie, and say, I've seen her when I thought she looked mighty nice, but I never got just that view of her before, with the moon kind of touching up her red hair and her cheeks and neck looking like white satin. She has a way, too, of staring off at nothing at all sometimes, and then there's a look in her eyes and a little twist to her mouth corners that just sets me tingling all over with the wantin' to put me arm around her and tell her that no matter who else goes back on her, there'll always be Shorty McCabe to fall back on. It wasn't anything new or sudden for me. I'd felt that way many a time, and as far back as when her mother ran a prune dispensary next door to my house, and she and I used to sit on the front steps after supper, She'd have spells of staring that way then, chopping off a laugh in the middle to do it, and maybe finishing up with a giggle. I guess that's only the Irish in her, but it always caught me. She must have been looking that way then, for the first thing I knows, I'd reached out and pulled her up close. She never kicks, but just snuggles her head down on my shoulder, with them blue eyes turned so I could look way down into em. At that, I draws a deep breath. Sadie, says I, husky-like, you're the best ever. She only smiles, kind of sober, but kind of contented, too. And if I had the noive, says I, I'd ask you to be Mrs. Shorty McCabe. It's too bad you've lost your noive so sudden, says she. What? says I. Will you, Sadie? Will you? Silly, says she, of course I will. Bless the saints, says I. When? Any time, Shorty, says she. You've been long enough about it, goodness knows. Well, say, you talk about your whirlwind finishes. I guess the crowd that was bunched there in the cabin saying good night must have thought I'd gone clear off my pivot the way I comes down the stairs. Where's the bishop, says I. Right here, my boy, says he. What's the matter? Matter, says I. Why, it's the greatest thing ever happened, and nobody to it. Folks, I says, if the bishop is willin' and hasn't forgot his lines, there's going to be a wedding take place right here in the main tent inside of fifteen minutes. Whoopee, I yells. Sadie said she would. That's the way we did it, too, and for a short notice affair, it was done in style even to a wedding march that someone feeds into the pianola and gets going. Pinckney digs up a ring, and the bishop gives us the nicest little off-hand talk you ever listens to. I blushes, and Sadie blushes, and Mrs. Twombly Crane hugs both of us when it's over. Then I has the steward lug up a lot of cold bottles, and I breaks a ten-year drought with a whole glass of fizz water. Right in the middle of the toast, the sailing master shows up on the stairs and says, We're just making harbor, sir. Forget it, Bassett, says I. I want you to drink to the health of Mrs. McCabe. And when he hears what's been going on, he's the most flabbergasted sailor man I ever saw. After that, we all has to go up and take a look at Newport and the warships but they was all as black and quiet as a side street in Brooklyn after ten o'clock. Say, it's a shame all them folks ain't in on this, says I. Bassett, can you make a little noise, just to let them know we are celebrating? Bassett thought he could. He hadn't made any mistake, either. In two shakes, we had all the lights aboard turned on, and sky rockets whizzing up as fast as they could be touched off. Did we wake up them warships? Well, rather. Foist, we hears a lot of dinner gongs going off. Then colored lanterns was sent up. Whistles blew. Bugles bugled. And inside of three minutes by the watch, there was guns bang-banging away like it was the 4th of July. 
Great Scott, says Pinckney. I never knew before that the United States Navy would turn out in the middle of the night to salute a private yacht. It depends on who owns the yacht, eh, Sadie, says I. By the time the guns got through banging, we had a dozen searchlights turned on us, and a strong lung gent on the nearest warship was yelling things at us through a megaphone. He wants to know, sir, says Bassett, if we've got the Secretary of the Navy on board. Tell him not guilty, says I, and Bassett did. That didn't satisfy Mr. Officer, though. Then why in thunder, says he, do you make such a fuss coming into the harbor at this time of night? Because I've just been getting married, says I in my Bosco voice. And who the blazes are you, says he. Can't you guess, says I. I'm Shorty McCabe. Oh, says he. And you could hear the ha-has come across the water from along the line. There was a wait for a minute, and then he hails again. Ahoy, Shorty McCabe, says he. The Commodore presents his compliments and says he hopes you liked your wedding salute. And if you don't mind, the gun crews want to give three cheers for Mrs. McCabe. So Sadie and I stands up by the rail, with more limelight on us than we ever had before or since. And about six hundred jackies gives us their college try. There wasn't anything slow about that as a send-off for a wedding tour, was there? But then, as I says to Sadie, look who we are. And say, if you'll be on the dock when we come back from Bar Harbor, we'll take you along down to Old Point with us, eh? Think it over. End of chapter 15 Recording by Scotty End of Shorty McCabe by Sewell Ford